here's one of the things I bought just a few weeks ago. These are the statutes of the Monte del Matrimonio de Bologna. This is an early bank in Bologna that was designed to help young ladies that were of little means to save up money for a dowry. And uh, it's kind of an early example of microfinance. And it's interesting, this institution is still in existence today. This is another thing I bought recently. These are the statutes of a little, of a town called Albenga, which is on the Mediterranean near Genoa. There's, I think, maybe one or two other copies of this in the United States. It's also interesting because it's heavily annotated. And at the end, the owner has actually updated it with additional statutes that were uh, enacted after the time the book was printed. So it's, in a way, both a manuscript and a, a printed book. One of the th valuable things about this collection is it shows uh, there, these are physical artifacts from, uh, from lawyers' offices and judges' offices from centuries ago. So it's a, a very concrete link to the past, to how lawyers worked beforehand. Here's another one. This is, has a very interesting aspect to it. This is an early Italian binding. This is a book from 1482 on law for notaries, including things like testaments and wills. The very interesting thing about this book is at the back and the front. Um, this item here is probably, could be the oldest single item in our entire collection. This is a, a fragment from a uh, medieval manuscript from the 10 hundreds. This is a fragment of uh, a thousand years, just about a thousand years old. It's actually a piece from a li uh, Lives of the Saints. This is Saint Alexander and it gives the story of his life. And what happened is this is basically recycled material. And long after these manuscripts became obsolete at the time, uh, bookbinders would cut them up and use them for binding material. And scholars today are very interested in these things because there are some texts that the only way we know they exist is because a bookbinder put a piece of one in a binding. So scholars today are very interested in this type of evidence. Some of the other things that we have acquired recently is American Trials. And this is a collection of this very notorious trial involving the murder of Captain Joseph White of Salem, Massachusetts. We've got a dozen different pamphlets or more relating to this trial. It was a very notorious trial at the time. And these pamphlets weren't really published for lawyers. This was popular literature. People like to buy, to read about scandal. They still do today. But it gives a real window on social mores and publishing history and everything for the 19th century. Another exhibit we did recently was on uh, freedom of the sea. It was involving the, um, the 400th anniversary of this landmark book in the history of international law by Hugo Grotius on the freedom of the seas. This is a beautiful little early 1633 edition of it, printed in Holland. And this little book that Grotius published really in many ways was the start of modern international law. So this was one example of that. I love the illustration there of the ship in full sail. It's just a great little piece. I mentioned before that uh, we've been blessed by having a number of the great law librarians. Another one is Morris Cohen, really one of the great American law librarians of the 20th century. He did a lot to build this collection, especially in early American law. He's also a collector, and Morris Cohen and his son, Dan, uh, began many years ago putting together a collection of law-related children's books. You would think there wouldn't be that many, but it just shows what a great collector can do. He put together a collection of, I don't know, 200 or more items that he's now donated to our rare book collection. And here's a couple of examples. Here's a little textbook for children, Pratt's Exposition of the Constitution of the, of the United States for School Children. This is dated 1836. And the collection also includes uh, modern children's books. This is Marshall, the Supreme Court Mouse, which is just a great piece. And it's an interesting collection in its own right, but it also has research value. You know, people uh, pick up their values, a lot of them as kids, through books like this. 
And this shows how people acquire their ideas about the law, you know, not just attorneys, but the public in general. One of the things that I've been collecting is law books with illustrations. This is one of my favorite examples here. This is a book called Opera Geometrica. It's a book by a French mathematician. And the last several essays in here is actually the, considered the first writings that are, it's geometry for lawyers. This book was printed in 1554. It, and has these wonderful woodcuts dealing with things like water rights and land rights. You have to use geometry to figure out who owns the, uh, the island in the middle of the stream. It has this wonderful woodcut here that's part of one of these essays. It shows some apparatus for measuring water flow. And I love this. Uh, the house in the back has a little label that says in Latin, uh, this is the author's house. I don't know why they put that, but I just love it. It's just a wonderful thing. This is uh, another thing I've acquired. This is the uh, French Penal Code, but it's illustrated. And it's, the illustrations are by this guy named Joseph uh, Emard, this French book illustrator. I just think this is a great, great book. It's hilarious. The text is actually the French Penal Code, but it has these great, great illustrations. They're hilarious. Here's one I can show you. This basically it's about contributory negligence or, or negligent homicide. You can see there uh, what's happening. It's, it's just a hilarious deal. Here's another recent acquisition I've got. This is uh, one of the classics of English law, Cook's Institutes. Cook on Littleton is known. Uh, this was used uh, heavily in legal education for centuries, even in the United States, although it's rather dense. This book is especially interesting because it has extremely heavy annotations all the way through. And it's as much a manuscript as it is a printed book. It's particularly interesting because we know who two of the annotators are. One of them was a man named Samuel Butler. He's famous as writing one of the great English bestsellers of the 17th century. And the other notes are by an English attorney named William de Longueville. So that's one of the great things that we have when we bought this fairly recently. The Yale Law School has a reputation, a long-standing reputation, as being one of the best places for law students who are interested in studying legal history. We've had a number of outstanding faculty and still do. It's a very important part of the curriculum here because it's a way to bring the law alive. Again, because of this connection with lawyers of time past, these are actual books that were used by attorneys in the past. And so it's a very live collection. A lot of students on their own take an interest in legal history, and this is a great resource for them, and they do make use of it. One thing I want to emphasize is that we really want students, law students, undergraduates here at Yale to come and use the collection. This is a working collection. It's part of the library. It's here to support legal research and education here. And students and faculty are our most important users. But we really want people to come use the collection. I think idle curiosity is a perfectly legitimate research use. And we get people, I have had students bring their parents in uh, when they're visiting. I have tour groups that come through. I love showing the collection off to you and anybody else who's interested. I encourage people to come and visit.